Um, I'm going to talk about NeuroElectro, just sort of uh, moving from models to data. Um, so the idea, the idea behind NeuroElectro is really simple. There's a lot of published data on neurophysiology. This is just a simple histogram of uh, like a PubMed search of neuron and electrophysiology and abstracts that contain those. So there's about like 45,000 articles that contain some, probably some data on, on electrophysiology. Um, so the idea about NeuroElectro is what can we learn by trying to compile it? Like, can we even compile it? And maybe if we could, we could, comp could compile it, we could have you know, really awesome data to put to these good models. Um, so yeah, that's the idea, to try and sort of get at this data in the published literature. Okay, but there's this massive problem. The literature is notoriously heterogeneous. Okay, people have known this for, for ages. Um, so two simple examples. Um, uh, you know, the, the, like the kind of, like, like we know that the kind of electrode you use to record like simple electrophysiological parameters like resting potential or input resistance, um, that's going to change depending on the kind of electrode you use. Um, if you record from neurons uh, in a slice, you often, uh, like you, you'll, you, you, could, you could choose to heat your slice or not heat your slice, and that, that change is going to affect the data that you collect. Um, and there really aren't any conventions for doing it one way or the other, and scientists kind of just do whatever they want. Okay, and so these differences are going to affect the data, and so everyone's like, man, like these, these differences are big, so I'm just going to go collect my own data. Um, and so, like, so maybe this is a problem, or I think this is a problem, but uh, so this is something to keep in mind. Um, another difference is just the, even the, nomen the, the, the nomen nomenclature itself is heterogeneous. Uh, for a simple property like input resistance, that's measured a number of different ways. So scientists don't even agree on the, on the simple meanings of things. Okay, so these are things to keep in mind as I'm going to talk about NeuroElectro. Okay. The overall methodology of NeuroElectro is we download tens of thousands of papers from the published literature. Okay. We have scripts that download them. And then from those papers, we try and extract structured information about the electrophysiology properties of different neuron types and electrophysiology properties. So for example, for like CA1 pyramidal cells, we may want to extract the actual electrophysiology property values corresponding to um, electrophysiology properties like input resistance, resting potential, spike width, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we want to put this data into a central database, and then when it's in the database, then it can be used for other, other, you know, other, other sort of needs like data analysis, like adding this data to models. Um, okay, so, so here's like a, a, just a quick overview of how our, the current methodology works. Um, so from these articles that we've downloaded, uh, I have scripts, uh, text mining scripts, that um, identify data tables that are published within these articles. So occasionally a scientist, when they, when they you know, record electrophysiology data, they'll summarize their measurements with a nicely formatted HTML data table. Okay, and that's nice because the data table is, you can, it's, it's relatively straightforward to extract information from that data table. Um, so what I need to identify is I first need to identify what type of neuron was being recorded. Okay, so here in this example, the type of neuron is a hippocampal pyramidal cell. And so what I need to do is I need to map this mention of a, of a neuron type to some, like, some listing, some canonical listing of neuron types. And so I'm using, I'm using a list of, listing of neuron types that's produced by neurolex.org, which is like an INCF-sponsored, uh, uh, you know, expert-defined expert listing of neuron types. Um, then I also need to identify the, uh, w which biophysical property was being, um, was, was being measured. Here in this case, the, the scientist uses the term uh, R, under, R subscript N, and that corresponds to the property input resistance. Um, and so I have like, algorithms that look for terms like that. And then once you identify both of those, then you need to, uh, they need to extract the biophysical data value. So in this case, this, this, the authors just report a mean and a standard error, so we extract both of those. Um, and I, I just want to mention again that like, this is done using algorithms, so like, you know, like text mining algorithms. Okay, Once you, so after we, after we extract the electrophysiology data, then we also extract some, some basic information about how the experiment was collected. So in this case, here's an example sentence from a method section saying that the, these experiments were done in brain slices, so the experiments were done in vitro. Um, it was done in, uh, in, in rats of this age, and it was done in the, the, the rat strain, like Worcester rats. And so we extract those, uh, like those highlighted bits as well. And then lastly, uh, because text mining is very error prone, and because like you know the the literature is very, uh, it's diverse. Like people don't use the same terms for things. Um, all the data that we extract is also checked by experts. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, all all this published or all this extracted data, it's available on the web at neuroelectro.org. Just show of hands, like who's seen neuroelectro? Okay. Who wants to see it and hasn't seen it? Uh, okay, I can give it, I'll, I'll just give a really quick demo. 
Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, nope. Where is it? Do you guys see it? Oh, here it is. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is the Neuroelectro web, web page. Uh, it's at neuroelectro.org. And so here, if I just click on this first tab, Neuron Types, okay, we get a listing of neuron types. These are the neuron types from Neuralex. Does someone have a favorite neuron type? Just yell one out. Okay. Oh, boy. Oh, that's going to be hard. I'm actually not going to... Oh, here it is. Great. <laughs> okay. So that neuron type's right here. So this is the page for inferior, inferior colliculus neuron. Okay. And each one of these is uh, a summary electrophysiology uh, table of measurements that were found for inferior colliculus neurons. And so these are the input resistance values that are found for inferior colliculus neurons. So each of these data points is a measurement of input resistance for an inferior colliculus neuron referenced to a, the, an actual article in which that data point was found. Okay, and so we found like these values from a number, you know, like maybe a few articles for these neurons. And, and so this is all the web we can make it interactive. So clicking on any one of these, one of these data points uh, takes you to the original data from which the, the takes you to the original article from which the data was extracted. Okay, and so here the, the original table is shown here, and so the, the colors indicate my algorithm's markups, and so you as the user can just check out, um, you know, was this done correctly or not. Okay. Uh, can I go here? Okay, so it's kind of hard to see, but over here, this is the, the contribute tab. And I just want to mention that, like, we've added features to allow users to contribute information to Nero Electro. And, and, like, you know, in the comfort of your home, I'd like you to go check it out. Because uh, what we want to do is, or we want to start doing is, I'm going to start, like, maybe trying to crowdsource the curation of data and have people begin to start adopting a neuron. Because I'm not an expert of all neuron types, nor do I really want to be. But I would like people to, you know, consider adding data about neuron types that they really care about. Okay, so let's get back to the presentation. Okay, is that here? Okay. Um, oh, and the, the, you know, the code's on GitHub, and the data is, we have an API to the data at neuroelectro.org. Okay. Okay, so here's some simple statistics about the data in the database. We currently index about the 100 most popular neuron types, um, and from those 100, like, that comes from about a little bit over 300 articles. So that 300 articles, like, it's probably like maybe between a half a percent to maybe 10% of all available data. It's, it's by no means all or the majority of the data. Like, there's still, you know, the database is still heavily underpopulated. Um, and most neuron types are actually only, um, we only have like a single article, a couple of articles that um, talk about a single neuron type. So we, we definitely like need to do better with like the redundancy of data and getting more data into the database. And uh, like some properties are more likely to be mentioned in a data table than others. Like, uh, so, you know, like we're, we're always trying to like, you know, add more data to the database. Um, so getting back to this issue of extensive variability um, that I mentioned earlier. So here, um, this is a plot of resting memory potential for like maybe the five most neuron types, uh, five, five most common neuron types. Um, and each one of these dots is the, uh, like comes from a paper. So this is itself a mean and standard deviation that was reported in a data table. Um, and we see that like, there's probably a spread of about 10 millivolts in the range reported for resting potential for any given neuron type. And so that, like, you know, like, 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 this data is variable. Okay? It's, it's highly variable. Um, and this, this is a, you know, a, a feature of all, all extracted properties. And so what, what we've started to do is we, um, we are, we're, we're trying to account for these, uh, you know, these, uh, these differences in the reported, reported uh, property values based on, uh, based on differences in, in the experimental conditions. So for example, um, for, uh, say, for input resistance, what really matters is what kind of electrode was used. Like, did the, the scientists use a patch clamp electrode or did they use a sharp electrode? Because if, if they use a sharp electrode, then like, the, the input resistance value that they report is going to be much less than the input res resistance value reported using a patch clamp electrode. So it's just a simple example of, of uh, you know, like a, like a, the, an experimental condition that matters for variance in a property. And uh, so, so like, like, given that we're extracting um, a number of properties, we're just applying linear corrections um, as best we can to account for the variance that we see across the electrophysiology data. Um, so I want to mention that we're, you know, we're extracting like, like probably like the most obvious things now, like electrotype, uh, animal age, recording temperature, junction potential correction, um, and we're continuing to extract, you know, further extract more properties like recording solution contents. Um, okay, so, so now that we have this giant database of, of electrophysiology properties across a number of neuron types, we can start to do some interesting analyses with it. 
So here, this is a hierarchical, cluster, a hierarchical clustering analysis where we just clustered the neuron types. Here, each row is a different neuron type um, based on its set of uh, six, six commonly reported electrophysiology property values. So three, um, three like passive properties like, like uh, input resistance, resting, resting potential, and uh, uh, memory time constant, and then three active properties, like three active like spike properties. Um, and then, so like, like the, the hierarchical clustering is shown on the left, that's on the dendrogram, and the actual neuron, the neuron types are shown on the right, like that's the, just indicated by the names. Um, so, and, and then on the, on the far right, like then we, we, I have like these super, these neuron super groups that I've just sort of defined based on the hierarchical clustering. Um, and so if we, if we like examine this, we see that like, you know, certain clusters that we would expect emerge. So for example, like fast spiking, by, fast spiking uh, basket cells um, in different parts of the brain, they cluster together. And so like, that, uh, that indicates that uh, maybe this procedure is working, working like it should. Um, and same with like cortical projection neurons. Um, but we also see like, like, you know, maybe novel classes that we wouldn't have expected beforehand. So uh, that's, an, that's an example of like, this sort of analysis that maybe is telling us something new that we wouldn't have been known beforehand with, uh, without, this, uh, without this database that we just created. Um, so lastly, like the, just the direction we're moving towards is like, uh, like we're, we're trying to integrate this database with other databases to say like no, novel things about science. So for example, uh, we have this data set Neuroelectro where, there's, where we have different neuron types with different electrophysiology property values. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm doing now in my postdoc lab is trying to integrate that with gene expression data sets. Like for example, like the Allen Institute has this really nice gene expression data set with a quantified gene expression in, in every region in the mouse brain. Um, you know, across the mouse genome. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to map uh, the electrophysiology phenotypes that we see for different neurons to the patterns of gene expression that those same neurons uh, express as indexed by the Allen Institute database. Okay, and so we, you know, we, want, we want to be able to explain like, okay, this is the reason why the neuron has ele the, this electrophysiology phenotype based on this pattern of gene expression. And what we want to do then is just make arbitrary hypotheses like relating, relating gene expression to electrophysiology. So maybe if we see that the, the, the neuron has like, you know, a particular like electrophysiology phenotype, like say for example, like a large SAG current, maybe we can say that, that that's actually due to this specific pattern of gene expression. And then, and then that, would get, that would sort of give the experimentalist a hypothesis that they, that they can then further test. Um, okay, so just, just to conclude really quickly with future directions, uh, we're currently trying to expand Neuroelectro to, to get more neuron types. We're expanding it to more domains, like trying to add information about synaptic plasticity. And then uh, I'm really interested in like, trying to continue to demonstrate the value of integrating different data, uh, databases, data sets. Um, because I, I think that's the way that I can, we can move to a situation where the experimentalists, like, they see the value in these approaches, and then they are, um, they're, they're willingly sharing, sharing their data with us. Okay, because like, I, I want to move to where like, we're not actually trying to mine the data, but where they're actually sharing it with us. So, because that would be much better and you know, better long term than trying to just mine the data from papers. Okay, let me end by acknowledging uh, you know, like my, my postdoc lab, the, the Pelitis lab at University of British Columbia, uh, my former, my PhD lab, the Nathan, lab of Nathan Urban at Carnegie Mellon, and, and Rick Gerken, who's going to talk next. Okay. I have a, oh, I, I was going to start as I've got the, the, the mi microphone. Uh, could, uh, have you looked at intracellular solutions? Because I'd have thought those, you know, for example, yeah. the uh, BAPTA or EGDA concentration would be absolutely crucial yeah. for, as, as a variable. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered if you could pull that sort of thing out of the papers. Yeah. And, and we haven't done it yet, but we are working on that right now. Okay. Yeah. Some of the papers we've done are in concentrations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. And that is that a, does that introduce a lot of variance, basically? Um, I don't know yet. Um, actually, my sense is that probably most of the data that we have does not include BAPTA or uh, calcium chelator. Like, yeah, it, it's what we call like a, like a, some, a standard vanilla intracellular solution. Sri Joy, I don't want to sink your battleship, but um, how do you know that a cell X in a, reported in a paper, mm -hmm. one, in paper one is identical with a cell Y re reported in paper two? So th th this is the fundamental problem of this. So how do you solve it? Uh, you, you do it in the best you can, or I've been doing how it do the best I can. It? I don't think there's a complete solution. Like, so the, so, you know, the, the NIH just, uh, like, one of the main key, t you know, 
grants for the brain initiative was let's define the cell types. So this is an open question. Okay. Um, the second question, which is related, how many? Can, can you go back, please, to the uh, cluster analysis? So how many? Uh, this one? Say instances you have there, how many uh, types you have there? About 40. 40? Yeah, the 40 most common ones, the 40 most popular neuron types. Popular? What do you mean by popular? Like we, where we have the most data for them. Okay. Uh, At least three articles. You, maybe you, you've been to um, the previous talk where only for the somatosensory cortex uh, primary, there are about 207. Neuro, uh, neural types based on morphology and electrical properties. Yeah. So, it, I mean, like, like hmm. so, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, so, so, you know like, what I, I try to, to say? I mean, like, I, I think I see what you're saying, and, like, you know, it gets, it gets back to the cell types question, like, whether you're a splitter or a lumper, and, like, I'm, 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 I'm a prag, oh, I'm yeah. talking about how many cell oh, types. types are you including in the analysis. Oh, I, I guess here, like, this is 40 uh, Neuralex cell types. Okay, but then this is showing that, like, you know, in terms of these electrophysiology properties, there's only really like 10 superclasses. So, so maybe the, the, the definition of cell type that's defined primarily by where the cell type is, is not like the, like, that's, that, that's all the same definition based on electrophys these electrophysiological phenotypes. Maybe I'm shaking her head, so I think I'm, or nodding her head, so I think I, yeah, she likes my answer. <laughs> Really don't, we don't know on what basis we're supposed to be splitting and lumping yeah. these things. So morphologically, we've come up with a whole lot of cell types. Yeah. They are not commonly referenced. So these 40 were the experts in the areas around the world saying, well, these are the ones we're sort of certain of. We yeah. know we're missing a whole lot. But, the, but when you actually say what constitutes a cell type in the nervous system, the answer is, well, do you go on function? Do you go on structure? Do you go on location? molecular expression, you know, I think these are the sorts of things that are telling us, because if we have to account for 100 million cells, we're in trouble. If, I suspect, you know, listening to one of my molecular biology colleagues who said, you know, the nice thing about the nervous system is only two types of cells, neurons and glia. I'm like, no, <laughs> that doesn't work either. Yeah. It's, it's some tractable number in between. Right. That's right. And it's like, you know, you'll, based on whether you really want to split or really lump, like you'll come with, the, you know, somewhere in between two and, you know, 100 billion. Ha, 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 ha.